Welcome to Paradise in the Pines, a podcast about the people, places, and stories that make this the home of American golf. Brought to you by the Pinehurst Southern Pines Aberdeen Area Convention and Visitors Bureau. Hello again, everybody. I'm Phil Wurz, President and CEO of the Pinehurst Southern Pines Aberdeen Area Convention and Visitors Bureau. And today we are joined by Ben Owen. Uh, Ben is one of the Seagrove Potters, one of the most renowned ones in the world. Uh, Definitely here in Seagrove. Before we taped, you said you're a dirt dauber. I I don't think that gives you (laughs) as much respect as you deserve, Ben. But thanks uh, for joining us in Paradise in the Pines. Well, thank you, Phil. And thank you for this opportunity to have a chance to visit with you. Absolutely. And we're here in Ben's home, which is absolutely stunning. Uh, I think you said you had an assistant count how many pieces of pottery you had in this other room, and he stopped at 1,100. Is that, that correct? That's correct. Uh, 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 needless to say, uh, uh, we've collected a lot of pots, whether they're historical, uh, some of our own family family's work, as well as pieces I've collected just from making over the last 40 years. And Ben's home is just steps away from a studio where you, where you can come in uh, pretty much on a daily basis uh, and check out uh, what you have going on. You are from Seagrove. Talk about growing up here and, uh, and how you fell into this incredible career as one of the best potters in the world. Well, um, one of the great things about uh, this community is just such the richness of uh, the clay history. Our, our family is one of the older families that moved to this area. And uh, through that, uh, they really began making pots out of necessity. So it really, uh, looking back at the history of it and then how I grew up, uh, looking at the type of pots they made and then also thinking about the type of work that was around my grandparents' home. Yeah. And that really was kind of the foundation or really eventually became the springboard for my curiosity and why clay was such an uh, integral part of our history, not only personally in our family, but also uh, affected a lot of the families in this community. So when I was a young kid, I would go to school next door at Westmore Elementary mm-hmm. School, and it's just walking distance from my grandparents' home. and. My mom was an educator. She taught in schools and worked with curriculum and helped schools with integrated testing and other things eventually. And my dad also was involved with our family business in the pottery while my grandfather was still making pots at, earlier back in the 60s and before then. But my grandfather had retired from working in clay just because of some health complications and other variables. But through that, uh, arthritis and things like that prevented him from being able to make pots on the wheel any further hmm. in his late 60s or early 70s and his age. And so when I came along, I was born in 1968, and um, I was about four years old when Granddad retired. And uh, But it wasn't until I was about eight or nine years old that my grandfather thought maybe I was big enough and old <laughs> enough. And I had to be a certain height. Uh, especially when he kind of envisioned me going out and working and making something on the wheel and show what he used to do in his career. Mm. And, and I mean, we, we sat at the dinner table as a family or just any, most any meal, we would have plates that granddad made. Yeah. Um, and we would eat off of those. And, um, there were a lot of bookcases full of books, but there were many bookcases full of pottery. Yeah. So it just really was interesting to, uh, know why, especially as a kid, like, well, why do we have all these pots on the shelves? <laughs> and and so granddad, little by little, would show me some things, and we would go to a a, a gallery show or art show sometimes. Mm. And then when I was about eight years old, my granddad had a show at the Museum of History in Raleigh, and it was kind of a retrospective uh, exhibition. It was, in part, some of the work was in their collection, but also it was pieces they borrowed from our collection here at my grandparents home and so they had a reception and we all had a chance to get dressed up and go to the reception and I was like wow granddad's really important (laughs) you know it's just you know all of a sudden all these pots are just in a a spotlight so he started showing me on the wheel and as I referred to earlier I had to be a certain height to be able to stand because he threw on the wheel standing up and so I had to be able to reach reach the gas pedal on the wheel at that time it was electric wheel um, that he was using in the last part of his career. But then later on, um, uh, you know, he, he, would able, he was able to show me how to work with the clay and process it. And some of the clay had dried out, and it was just sitting in the corner from many years 
after he retired. And when he closed the door, he literally closed the door and just went to the house and said, that's it. I just hmm. can't do anymore. So uh, he had spent a, a career of making pots for over 36 plus years at Jugtown Pottery, okay. which is nearby. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he worked for the Busby's, uh, Jacques and Juliana Busby. And I can talk more about that a little bit more later. But, um, but he really took me on a daily schedule going out to the the studio when I would walk home from school next door and most days when he was feeling good I was able to go out and maybe try my hand at making a pot on the wheel right. and so some of those pots in the beginning they look somewhat like a door stopper or <laughs> anchor weight or something like that that could be used in some other purpose than a, a vessel at the dinner table but uh, over time he would set up a cup or a, a bowl or something like that at the wheel and then he showed me how to position my hands and really learn how to shape the clay and learn how to control it. And those were some really great memories for yeah. me. That, that's awesome. And, and how much, how much did he instill that in you? Obviously you're doing it now decades later. Um, so it's, it's just unusual for an eight year old at that time to, to know that's what, did you know that's what you wanted to be the rest of your life? I, I probably, I don't think I knew at the time that's what I wanted to do, but all I know is, um, I was just looking forward to going out to the studio whenever he felt like going. And um, there were occasions where his health didn't allow him to go out. He just, he either had a lot of pain or something from arthritis. He had it in his legs, his hands, pretty much all over his body in some mm -hmm. ways. And, and he had some heart issues also. And so some days he just did not feel good at all. And, and so sometimes I would go out to the studio just on my own later on after you know, having a little time out there and knew what to do to the routine to be able to go and work on the wheel and prepare everything. So I told my grandma, I remember I was probably about 11, 12 years old, I think around that time frame. And he had some teapots and uh, some other shapes out there. And I'd always wanted to try making one, but he always found a way to kind of back me up and say, well, all right, we need to work on some other fundamentals before you advance to a shape like that. Mm. So but I was still determined. I was. Oh, I want to learn how to make a candle holder. I want to learn how to make a teapot. And so I snuck one of the teapots out of the collection one day when he wasn't feeling well, and I took it out to the shop. And and so I proceeded to really work over and over trying to make that form and then eventually make the spout, the handle, the mm. lid, and all the components that go into the making of a, a finished piece. And so I made three of them. And... Granddad spent several days where he just didn't really feel like he could come out there, so I kind of kept it a secret. And once I felt like I had the teapots together to a point, I felt like <laughs> I could show him. I took all three out to the to the shop to the home next door and had him to kind of give me some pointers. So he saw them when I walked in on the board, and he were like, he was like, "Okay, you made your knob too small, you made your <laughs> spout too big, you made your handle too thin," and. And he sat right up and just started giving me like coaching things. And, right. And then the next day he was like back to feeling so much better huh. in the studio helping me again. That's so, great. So a lot of people have, especially in family, have accredited that they feel like granddad was able to uh, hang on and, and be around longer because of his health issues, because of my influence and, and my interest in clay. Now, 50 some odd years later, how much has the industry evolved or is it still pretty much the basics uh, and you just use your own creativity uh, to produce what you produce? Well, the, the type of work that we make really is reflective of not only the foundation of early potter, potters in this area making work, but also outside influences. And those influences took place through the one example, like when the Busby's came to the area and they weren't potters. Uh, they were, uh, Mr. Busby was a painter and Juliana, mm -hmm. she was more of a, uh, more into botanical and more uh, just working with ideas of bringing other resources into the clay materials and, and how it could be used or like a vessel for holding uh, beautification instead of it just being purely functional. So I think some of the elements of coming from a, out of necessity, making pots that people need, when early uh, families came here to the area, they, they treated the situation of making things for themselves, but they also made things for neighbors and other people in the community. 
so they were very distinctive jug towns in North Carolina. Right. So just the Busbys decided to name their pottery jug town because of the historical context of it. But there were other areas up in Alamance County around Burlington area and uh, those areas in Chatham County that were jug towns. And then uh, Catawba Valley area, more closer to Hickory, Lincolnton area, Vail, North Carolina, that was a jug town. And then up in Asheville area, Arden area was a mm-hmm. jug town area as well. So thinking about it from that context, how potters made things in those communities, almost like a village that makes uh, weaving or basketry or other elements. There was actually a, a historical context of ba- basket making in Moore County as mm-hmm. well. So uh, looking at the potters in this community, they would go and they would barter with other people, other 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 words that can make things for them, like build a house or build a barn or make a dress for them in those ways. So they supported each other. And then the 20th century, uh, you know, the demand for pottery really changed and evolved into uh, more of a industrial look of it. You think about how glass and metal containers and even ceramic industry started playing a, a role in supplying those needs in America. And the local potters are were kind of like the mom and pop shops of today that maybe compete with Walmart or something in that that realm. Hmm. But but the potters had to either take the opportunity to consider retooling or changing the way they make pieces instead of making just the basic colors or making something as long as it held one gallon or it baked a casserole or those kinds of things. Yes, they were important, but they had to really have a little more color or design to them and and that's what the Busby's as well as the Cole family several other Potter generations of that time of my grandfather's generation in the early 1900s they saw they had to change what they were making if they were going to survive otherwise they would have to go work in Robbins nearby in the textile mills or become a carpenter or other Mm -hmm. other occupations over the years, I mean, how has your craft evolved? What are some of your favorite pieces to do? Because when you come to Seagrove, everybody has their own style because uh, there, there are dozens of potters here. But what have you kind of honed in on uh, that has been more your expertise or style that's distinctive to, to Ben Owen? Well, uh, really, uh, my foundation comes from what I learned from my grandfather. But uh, keep in mind the the vision that granddad and the Busby's had was looking at other cultures like in Southeast Asia, Hmm. uh, more uh, maybe Korean, Japanese styles of designs. So looking at some of the history of some of those pieces they were inspired by, they would go to museums in the Metropolitan or Smithsonian and other places, and they would bring back ideas through the form of sketches or photographs, and they would come back and recreate or interpret their own interpretation of the or that design or shape of a vase or a jar or uh, whatever it may be. but And then thinking about color and design. So my foundation has been built on looking at some of those inspirations they had back in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, hmm. and how those really were proved to be successful uh, uh, ways of approaching the work. And, and I've taken the opportunity to be able to go and travel even though I went to college and studied more of the business side of uh, running a business and, and then also the artistic elements of being at, um, at Pfeiffer College or now Pfeiffer University. I taught some pottery classes while I was there, and so it was kind of a role reversal for me to teach other people, but then also going to East Carolina University mm-hmm. and actually learning more about design, learning about color and uh, color theory, uh, how to photograph work, how to uh, represent your work and how to uh, display your work, especially with helping with exhibitions and things like that in the university setting. So uh, thinking back of the influences of the work I make, and really I, I am a still can, and can still continue to be a, a vessel maker. I work with this earthen clay, but I'm forming a glass or shaping and applying a glass to the surface of these vessels. Uh, almost like a tailor making a, an item of clothing for a, someone's mm. specific body shape or style, whether it's a suit or a dress and that kind of thing. So in my world, I'm trying to make sure that the, the physics as well as the chemistry of the materials are going to fit and complement the, the type of vessels I make. And it sounds kind of complicated in some ways, but <laughs> um, but really we're just melting a glass on the surface of a pot. But then what type of materials are we adding to it 
that give it more interesting effects, whether it's texture or color or variation to it. Some of those come in the form of the chemistry of materials that we add in the glass, but then others uh, that we continue in our tradition is firing in our wood kilns. So wood firing has really continued to be a way of enhancing the surface of a pot, kind of giving a pot an, an influence or accent on one side of the piece, especially the side that's facing the heat source. Most of our kilns are kind of a cross draft effect, so they have an effect on one side of the pot, and then the back side is facing away from the flame or the heat source, so there'll be a different color response from front mm. to back and as you progress around the piece. And so do you think back about the pots that the potters had to fire and finish back then? They used wood as their f source of fuel to heat and mature the pots into hard vessels and then melt the glass on the surface. They just wanted to make sure the glass melted and everything was successful. But today, in looking at influences from Asian cultures and other influences of wood firing, taking a longer firing effect really plays a big role in how the, the surface is going to develop. Take, for example, uh, say you're wanting to use a smoker grill to put salmon in there and give it kind of an enhanced effect with whatever types of chips you put in there mm -hmm. to give the flavoring and enhancement. In our world, we're kind of doing that effect with wood firing but if you go only a half an hour in a smoker grill and allow the effects to take place, you may have some of the flavor and effects to occur. But if you go for several hours, you're going to have a more big enhanced effect. Yeah. It's going to be a big difference. So some of our works and finishes we have to do in the approach of making a pizza and other effects is more like making brisket. <laughs> okay. So it's kind of yeah. a, a way of thinking about how, how we work with the type of glazes. Some glazes, we will destroy the glaze if we went and put it in. So if you put that pizza in a brisket in the oven at the same time and you went with the pizza format, then the brisket's going to be raw. <laughs> so then, But if you go with the brisket right. the format, then the pizza's going to be a burnt crust. So it's kind of, so uh, yes, you can design glazes that will fit all in one firing technique, but to have a wider palette of colors, you have to be willing to adapt and change the firing sequence or firing methods or temperatures and so on. So those have been a big factor in building a foundation for color and texture and the type of works I make today. Here in Seagrove, uh, we mentioned there are dozens of potters, and you mentioned kiln and kiln firing. These, these phrases have certain meaning, obviously, to you. So when, for the general consumer like myself that wants to come to Seagrove, obviously any time of year is a great time to do it, but you do spring and fall kiln openings. What, what does that mean, and what is, what is the, the tourist or the visitor going to see when they come uh, witness that? So uh, our studios in the Seagrove area are open most year round. Some people take breaks in January or those times of year just because it's been the hectic mm -hmm. holiday season or you know the, the shopping season like that. So they want a break or they need to work on equipment, that kind of thing. But, but kiln openings um, have been a long-standing tradition for potters. They pretty much are taking the format of working on a body of work or a, a whole selection or arrangement of pieces that they take the time and effort to make a body. And then from there, they fill up the kiln, do the firing, conduct the firing process. Some of those firings take anywhere from a day to up to four days for the firing process, depending on the type of kiln and the way they work with their, their equipment. And then it takes a few days to cool down, two to five days to cool down. And then they go through the process of unloading the kiln. So historically, uh, in the past, g previous generations would do kiln openings and they would have where people would literally come out and actually see the work coming out of the kiln at that time. So mm -hmm. they would set a time and date, and people would come out and actually see the work coming freshly out of the kiln. Yeah. And so only the helpers or the potter or people involved with the firing and unloading really are the only ones that have touched those pieces. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like, a like, hey, we get the first pick yeah. of, of things. So it really built into a tradition like the Cole family. Uh, they would have kiln openings, and people would line up along the – the dirt road and park and go visit on a Saturday morning, first thing in the morning and uh, go and get first pick of what they wanted from the new selection of work mm -hmm. they made. And so fast forward to today in the last few decades, we've been able to conduct and have a spring opening and a fall uh, opening or a festival where people come together, the potters come together as a community In the spring it's a studio tour. And in the fall, typically we have the festival in the Seagrove area and the, 
now today we have it in the renovated uh, Lux Cannery. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, those are um, kind of the main formats we do now. We have some other events in the summer, like we have it where people can come out and visit, like in July, and see what the potters are doing in the summertime mm -hmm. and visit the studio. Maybe uh, have a chance to do a hands-on uh, format for the for customers to come in and try their hand at making a pot on the wheel yeah. or or someone's demoing, uh, like. Um, uh, some of the particular techniques or someone has a kiln firing not a lot of people like to fire wood kilns in july just because it's so it's hot, so hot. So, so, <laughs> right. so, and some customers ask well you know does it do the kilns heat up much easier in the summertime than they do in the winter and i'm like well i guess maybe a little <laughs> bit so it's kind of one of those things but uh but uh for the most part um i think just our community has come together over the years and the potters have worked together to in a effort to let people know that they can come to special events, but also uh, the studios are open year round and people can come in at their own leisurely time and see what studios have available. Well, the CVB is proud to be a sponsor of the celebration of Seagrove Potters, which as we record this is just a couple of weeks away. So it's a 15th annual uh, right here in Seagrove. If you can go to discoverseagrove.com to learn more about that, but tell us uh, if you're planning on coming up here, that's November 19th and 20th, uh, 2022. Uh, what are they going to see? Uh, what should be what should we be looking for? So this year um, we uh, have a, a new format for it because dealing with what we've had to deal with and co with COVID over the last few years, it's played a mm. a role. And just we 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 had a studio tour in the past just to kind of keep people spaced out and because we wanted to be safe and make customers feel safe instead of being in a concentrated area of a right. festival in one building or one space. So this year, because COVID has settled down and we feel like things are a little better in circumstance, we're having the festival up in the historic Lux Cannery that's been remodeled, and it will continue to be remodeled into an even bigger facility for bigger events in the future. So we have uh, about 20 potters that are setting up booths in the space at the cannery, and people can go and shop in one location there. So we're really excited about having the festival again since having a break for a few years but also we're having a studio tour so people can come out and visit the potters in their individual settings right. at the same time. So November 19th, the Saturday, and the 20th, the Sunday, uh, we'll have it where people can come out and be able to go and visit. There's plenty of food, uh, refreshments, that kind of stuff up there at the cannery for people to go and enjoy uh, along with shopping and just seeing some of the early chances to be able to do some Christmas shopping and just see what the potters in the area are creating. But also the studios in the area, too, they open their doors and make it where some people will be demoing in their studios or showing other process, but all mainly just uh, being able to see the new works that are available. And certainly recommend that November 19th and 20th and 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 the time that we've gotten to know you've been over the last few years and you had appreciation for video because you do that yourself for, for your church. Uh, yeah. So we know and you understand this process with the podcast and everything. But one thing we enjoy when we work with you is getting around to meet some of the other potters, which people can do uh, anytime. And so one of our favorites, Fred Johnston, uh, who's, who's yeah. a real character. He's he's yeah. from Virginia as well. Like he's from Chesapeake, Virginia. I'm from Virginia Beach, but uh, a real character. So talk about Fred and some of your other favorite potters in this community. I know you can name dozens of them, but who are some of your favorites? Gosh, well, it's uh, being put on the spot. It's uh, <laughs> but it's uh, but th there are so many talented people in this community. And uh, one thing I want to note that people like Fred and uh, his wife Carol, mm -hmm. uh, they're among several people that came here to this area. They found out about the history of the Seagrove area and what the potters were doing. And Fred actually came and he worked for us at, here at our studio for okay. a while Didn't while he that. was in college or in between college. Mm -hmm. And he would uh, help us with different parts of the process and prepping this and making a piece of pottery. There are over a dozen chapters in the making of it. The making of it isn't one of the most important ones, but all the things in advance with clay preparation to the process of uh, finishing the work and then firing the kilns and unloading and aspects. But but the potters in this community that I want to note out is uh, like Fred and Carol and uh, Anne Partna. Uh, she's from Estonia, and her husband Adam. They uh, they have a studio here in the area, Blue Hen Pottery. Uh, but many of them, Takro and Hitomi Shibata, they're from Shigaraki, Japan. Hmm. What has happened in the last few decades is people have decided to come here as potters, either through apprenticeships or connections with potters in this community. And they decide to move here and add to the tradition and add their own diversity of styles and techniques that they have brought either 
whether they learn, like Fred and Carol, they went to school at Alfred University in Penn State, and they came here with ideas and techniques that they had developed, mm -hmm. and they added to that uh, tradition or what we have in our community, and I think that's what really makes this area so unique and really special is it's really difficult to see all the places in one day in the area yeah. or even much less even a weekend. Um, I, I think you really have to kind of go and kind of pick and choose certain places to go visit and then plan to come back again and then visit some different shops in the area because you're going to see such a wide variety of work that's being made. And, and I think we've been able to enhance our community, not only building on the foundation that we've had from traditional families like my family and others in the area, but you go to a Jugtown Pottery nearby yeah. and see my cousins, uh, Vernon and Pam, and their, <laughs> their kids, Travis and Bailey, continuing in the tradition, making pots there. And it has such rich history and roots and influence on so many potters that either came and apprenticed and worked there at the studio, but also how they're continuing and working in their own style and influences from that early tradition. But how that has been just such a springboard for a lot of potters who have stumbled on working in clay and how they have been able to add to this community. Take, for example, Fred and Carol, uh, th what they make, and they use the pots as a canvas in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. uh, Fred likes to use the vessels. He throws these wonderful forms and designs, but then he takes the, the pot as a canvas, and he loves to go fly fishing. And he's taken me along with him, too, sometimes <laughs> when I've had time to go. And, and uh, just being out in nature and having that influence uh, for inspiration, what you do on the surface of a pot. Uh, or take a Kate Waltman, who went to school at Alfred University also. Mm -hmm. She's at the Triangle Studio, how she uses the surface uh, to carve flowers and designs and uh, just her inspiration for designs that really mean so much in part of her life, and it really fuels her to be even more creative. Carol, uh, Fred's wife, uh, she likes to do more sculptural pieces, and she will adorn the surface with so many designs and patterns, whether they be decals or something she carves out individually that's just coming from her mind that she wants to carve on there. Or maybe it was a, a landscape that she saw while they were outside hiking yeah. somewhere. And so I think those are the types of things that we are uh, really happy about in this community that it's just making our area even more unique and special. And I think it's cool, too, that not only do you get to see some really creative works, but to get to speak and actually meet the artists mm -hmm. and understand these personalities, their influences, their inspirations, uh, just some really cool stories that are out there. And you mentioned taking multiple days to do that. I mean, Seagrove, I mean, there are dozens of potters here. You've got the General, which is a really cool place to hang out. Uh, yeah. They've got great beer and uh, some food as well. Uh, you've got Kegel's Diner, which is not far away, which has been featured. Their cheeseburgers are phenomenal. Yeah. You took us there one day. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then Pinehurst is only 40, 45 minutes away. So talk about the people that come up here that maybe go down there for a golf visit. We're the home of American golf. But, you know, we always tell people, hey, Seagrove is just a short drive away. Half of it's in Moore County and our friends in Randolph County. Uh, obviously, the Seagrove is in Randolph County uh, and, and you're located here in Moore County. So uh, mm -hmm. so it's very close by. Talk about the, the proximity to Pinehurst, the home of American golf and, and um, what that means to those people coming up here to visit. Well, Pinehurst and Southern Pines, Aberdeen areas really played a big role in how successful we were, especially thinking early on in the my grandfather's generation at that time, uh, when the early earliest golf courses were established in the Pinehurst area, uh, they found out about the potters and the craftsmen up in the in the northern part of Moore County and bordering Randolph, Montgomery County, and, and Chatham County area. Because of this area, the, the, the way the clay was able to form and they were able to find the materials here in this area was really a big magnet for people coming here as potters. But also the customers... Uh, especially coming and visiting from up in the Northeast and some of the earliest times they would come and play golf, uh, some of the work that they took back with them uh, was from the Potters, either from the Cole family or the Cravens or the Teague families, uh, Luck, uh, Chris Coe's and Owen family as well and Almonds. So uh, they would take those pieces uh, back with them and have them back at home wherever they lived. And in the last couple of decades I've had so many people contact us and ask us we have hmm. this a piece of pottery that our grandparents had in the collection and we found your website huh. and it looks a lot like what you make now yeah and they send me for more photographs of the piece and they're like 
Wow, yeah, your granddad did make that. And and so huh. it's just interesting how those connections have been tied in with how they encountered or came to this area. And fast forward to today and in recent times, over the last many years, a lot of people come up. They may be into golf or maybe it's a, a day when, unfortunately, it really rained hard and they couldn't play around. <laughs> so it's kind of, you have those days. So, right. Um, but they would come up and visit uh, when they had the time and, and uh, never been here before. And they're like, wow, I had no idea there were so many artisans and craftsmen working in clay up in this area. And they learn about Star Works nearby with the glass blowing mm -hmm. and, and the art gallery there and just the educational components of it, as well as the North Carolina Pottery Center that we have up in Seagrove. That right. Shows a lot of the history, mm -hmm. not only of the Seagrove area, it's a given, but also pottery and history uh, for the whole state as well. Very informative. It's a great experience to hit the museum there as well. You mentioned golf. I mean, I know you like to play tennis. Uh, do you like to play golf? I got to ask you. I do. I enjoy when I can. Um, I had some friends and fellow potters over the years. They said, well, you need to go play some golf with us. And I'm like, well, I played tennis mostly. And so back when I was uh, back in the late 90s and the early 2000s, I started playing a little bit of golf and I do pretty good, so if I can stay in the <laughs> below three digits, I'm really happy. So, uh, but uh, it just depends. But uh, being a potter and working in the studio and working with clay, it it's not a nine to five job. It uh, there's so many times when things have to be uh, paid attention to, or you could put plastic over pieces and hold them on standby for the time. But um, but when I can, I do like to go out and play. I'll play a few times a year and. But the courses, I've played Pine Needles, I've played Talamore, I've played National, different ones down there. And it's just been really a, a lot of fun to go. And But uh, I think Pine Needles was one of my favorites just because of the, it's just so beautiful. I mean, it, all of them are. They but are it's beautiful, just, yeah. Uh, but but the as far as the customers that come out, uh, we have a lot that come out that want to visit from Pinehurst Resort. Uh, some of the tour agencies like Kirk Tours that come to the mm -hmm. area, uh, they'll bring people up and and we'll have a chance to do a demo and show people a little bit about a little bit about the process. Take behind the scenes, aside from just seeing in our retail store, and we give them a chance to uh, learn a little bit more about it. But lots of times, uh, my number one question I ask them when they're going back to Pinehurst, I'm like, "What well, do you have dinner plans tonight?" And they say, "Well, no, we really don't have many plans tonight." And I say, "Well, what what are your taste buds like?" And uh, so, what do you what do you like? And so, I keep a roster of. Uh, like restaurants and places. So naturally, I like to send them to Pinehurst Village and send them to Lisi or mm -hmm. different places around and um, or Drum and Quill if you like to do something kind of casual laid yeah. back, but, uh, but or go to Pinecrest Inn or Holly Inn. And but then I'd tell them more about Ironwood Cafe and different places around, but then also get over in Southern Pines and just venture oh around my gosh. downtown up and, and down Broad Street. Yeah, and plenty Chef of Warren's restaurants and uh, the Jefferson and so on. So it's just we went to um. Southern Prime not long ago, okay. and that was yeah. really, really, really good. And so uh, they're just that we're just so thankful, and we're really fortunate to have places like this nearby. So when people Absolutely. come out, and keep in mind when people do visit this area, we call it kind of the four corners. People come from Pinehurst area, they come from Charlotte Mecklenburg area, they come from Piedmont Triad, mm -hmm. and they come from Research Triangle Park. So it's kind of a day trip. But then we have people that come from those areas. We had a family come recently, and they were from Charlotte area. And they thought, wow, we've got to have more than a day to see all this. So they ended <laughs> up staying overnight down in Pinehurst yeah. and enjoyed some dinner. And I gave them some suggestions of where to go and stay and, and then uh, places to eat. And then they ended up spending like three days in the area. And they were just they're like, we want to bring our family back. Well, they just opened up a three-room hotel in Robbins, the Solomon Inn. So it's right there in downtown, right next to the coffee shop. And uh, so the area is growing. We saw Senator McGinnis there. And as you know, this area is going to grow northern more with, with the Toyota plant. You did some work for Toyota uh, with, with, your, your, with your pottery. I did. Um, back earlier in the, the spring, they were asking if I could uh, do a special piece in my Chinese red glaze. And... It was for the CEO of the Toyota uh, company, and they wanted to give it to him at the ribbon cutting, ribbon cutting for the, the new EV plant that's going to be built up in the northern part, kind of northeast side of Randolph mm -hmm. County. But it's going to be a big uh, draw for people coming to the area, not only for employment, but it's just going to, uh, uh, this whole area is going to grow because of those variables that are going on. But So the governor uh, decided to give a piece of my red as a thank you for coming and, and being here in North Carolina. So 
I think those are going to really help enhance our community and our region of North Carolina. Absolutely. And, and in our office, I'll, I'll mention, we were talking about golf. Uh, and as Dan knows, uh, who's our podcast producer and destination storyteller, we have a putting green in our office. And actually, the putter we use, uh, the mayor of Seagrove, made that for right. us. Uh, so it's actually a pretty solid putter. I've used it on actual golf course before. Uh, so uh, we have a lot of fun with that in our office, but uh, if we can do one last thing before we go, uh, talk about, um, the celebration of Seagrove Potters one last time, how can people learn more and, uh, and the dates of that event? So I, I think it's a really a wonderful opportunity to be able to see firsthand a wide range of work that's being made in the area. So if you can go and visit discoverseagrove.com, the website and go to the events page you'll see the celebration of seagrove potters festival and also information about the studio tour and you will see a link you could print out a map you could buy an early bird ticket mm -hmm. we're giving a chance for people to buy early bird tickets on the website to shop between 9 and 10 a.m at the festival so you get first pick of some of the work of the new work that's being made by the potters so it's really a great opportunity and i hope you can uh, have a chance to learn more about it and come and visit us and your website is my website is benowenpottery.com, and you can see a wide range of work there as well, learn about our history, as well as an online store to shop. If you live far away and you don't have a chance to visit in person, we do sell them online as well. Well, Ben, it's been a pleasure uh, talking to you. We could go on and on for hours talking about your work. Uh, this wonderful community of Seagrove. If you get a chance, folks, come to Seagrove, North Carolina. It's a fabulous place, not far uh, from Pinehurst, North Carolina, inside the home of American Golf. So if you want to learn more about our destination and book a package or look at hotel stays so you can explore this great area, go to homogolf.com. For this vodcast, go to our YouTube channel, which is Home of American Golf. And to download this podcast, just search Paradise in the Pines on your favorite podcatcher. For Phil Wurz, Ben Owen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. And thank uh, you. best of luck uh, with the celebration of Seagrove Potters. And uh, thanks for joining us at Paradise in the Pines. Well, thank you. And thank you for all your support, too, of our community. And, and uh, I think it's really wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Take care. We'll see you next time. I actually have one of those butter. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it butts really well. He made one a little bit heavier. Okay. I've had a few. Yeah. It's USGA approved, too. Yeah. So uh, I told him. I had a smaller one.